religions of the world. Just as a reminder of our goals that's been consistent throughout the series, first of all, to examine some key teachings, stories, rituals, or practices that are connected with the tradition, not to cover the whole tradition, right, just to zero in on a few things, and then to consider how some of those things might challenge us as Christians or Episcopalian Christians, but also enlighten us in our continuing search to love God and to be more loving neighbors to the people who live right here in this community, as well as people around the world who ascribe to different faiths. The topic for today is Islam, so I like to give a little bit of a preview of the things that I'll focus on uh, toward the end that I personally find both challenging and illuminating or enlightening as an Episcopalian Christian. And the first of those is going to be the beauty of the Quran. All right, I'll talk more about the Quran later, but it's the sacred text in Islam. The other one is going to be fixed hour prayer. So we as Episcopalians have a tradition of fixed hour prayer that is prayer at specific times of day. Um, and it, it's something that can be done on the go, right? Some people come here for morning prayer every weekday. Uh, some use the Facebook live stream to participate in our parish's um, tradition of prayer, morning prayer. We also have evening prayer. And other people kind of practice wherever they are, saying morning prayer, evening prayer, or some others as well. But in Islam, there's also a tradition of fixed hour prayer, kind of on the go, sometimes in a mosque, but often wherever you are at that time of day. And lastly, this emphasis on God's overriding mercy. Uh, the more I hear from Muslims, the stronger that takeaway is, right, that, that Allah or God is merciful. That is the central quality of God. All right, so I'm going to return to something that I did way back when we discussed Hinduism, and that was distinguish broadly two different types of religious traditions. So the first type or model we call the tree model, right? That's where you have a pretty clear catalyst or founder, right, whose insight, whose teaching, whose way of life, something about them establishes a new religious tradition that then kind of grows and evolves and branches out to uh, diverse forms. And the other model of religion, Hinduism, fit this category, uh, is the river model, where you have lots of different traditions, right, and practices, beliefs, teachings, texts, whatever they are, and they kind of funnel into a common, more coherent stream at a later period in human history. So Hinduism followed that model. So I just bring that up again to stress that now with Islam, we're definitely in a tree model. But I also want to remind us that all these trees, right, they have roots, right? Jesus didn't wake up one day and say, ah, enough with this other religion. I'm going to start a new one, right? You know, he draws on, builds on uh, the faith that had sustained his community for thousands of years prior. All right. But if we are going to think about a uh, kind of the tree, a source, one place that we would certainly start with Islam is with the prophet Muhammad. I'm not going to do this consistently, but um, it's common in um, Islam to follow the name of the prophet Muhammad with a phrase often presented as an acronym for peace be upon him or peace and blessings be upon him. So I did that here just so you can see it. Sometimes they use the um, initials of what the Arabic words would be. So these years here are the years of the Prophet Muhammad's life from about 570 to 632. So just to orient us in time, right, that's a good half a millennium after the birth of Christ. A title for the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, that is the last prophet. So in Islam, uh, many figures are regarded as prophets who uh, Christians also regard as having prophetic or sig patriarchal significant authority. And in Islam, uh, Adam, these are just examples, Adam, Moses, and Jesus himself are considered to be prophets. So I, I remember knowing that um, Jesus still had a prominence within Islam, not the same as in Christianity, but it really came home to me when I was in Toronto, I think in 20, this, yeah, the summer of 2018, 
And I was just walking around the streets of Toronto, which is the most diverse city I've ever been, diverse in so many different ways. And there was a young man who had a, a table with kind of uh, Muslim, I don't know, I don't know how to describe this, kind of Muslim outreach literature, I guess we could say. I'm used to seeing Christians do that, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera. They have a table with pamphlets and, you know, people willing to talk to you. Um, but this Muslim man had one, and the, the, the banner on the front of the table was, I love Jesus because I am Muslim, right? So he was trying to counteract uh, stereotypes or visions of Islam as maybe opposed to Jesus or anti-Christian or something like that. Um, but that was his angle of outreach, was saying that, you know, Jesus has a prominence with our tradition to, in our tradition too, right? So they have this series of prophets, but Muhammad is the seal of the prophet, the last of the prophets. So the overriding message in Islam is to uh, the desire to restore the pure monotheism that Abraham had. So Abraham knew God to be one. Other prophets in human history had, had it, from this perspective, had had a clear message from God. But over time in the scriptures, the scriptures of the Hebrew Bible, as well as the Christian New Testament, the message had gotten muddled a little bit from this perspective. And so Muhammad's role was to restore the clarity of the message, which was that God is one. Uh, Muhammad also, though, plays a role in Islam as a model of this really central virtue of submission, that is submission to Allah, submission to God. So he's both a teacher and an exemplary figure. And unlike Jesus, uh, the prophet Muhammad played lots of different roles um, in his building his faith community. He lived a lot longer than Jesus, okay, I think to about 80, like um, just like uh, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. He was a hut. So, so Jesus wasn't a family man, right? Um, but there's a long tradition of Christian affirmation, celebration of family life, but it's not something that either Jesus or the Apostle Paul chose for themselves, but, but the prophet Muhammad did. Uh, his first wife was a businesswoman, right? Um, he's a father, he's a military leader, he's a lawmaker. So the prophet Muhammad occupied a lot of roles that Jesus himself did not. So some people think of, Jesus, if you compare to Christianity, think of Muhammad as um, Jesus, the Paul the Apostle, and Emperor Constantine kind of all wrapped up into one. So in Christian history, lots of different figures built Christianity um, over time, but the prophet Muhammad played all of those roles himself. So I do want to emphasize that, that Muslims do not worship the prophet Muhammad, okay? They don't have beliefs about him being divine. Um, he, but he does play this specific role of the um, seal of the prophets and a model for different types of life and builder of a religious tradition. So the Quran is the sacred text within Islam. Quran means recitation. And it, it's not something that the prophet Muhammad just you know, heard one day and wrote down. So these are uh, recitations or revelations that were received over a pretty long period of time, so over 23 years. So scholars date these to different periods in the Prophet Muhammad's life. Uh, some of the strongest themes, um, I, I haven't read the Quran cover to cover, but when I started to read it more sequentially rather than just, you know, a verse here and a verse there, um, this is really what came forth, this warning of human beings about a coming day of judgment. All right, this is also a theme of the later scriptures of the Hebrew Bible uh, and um, some Christian texts as well. So there will be a day of resurrection on, upon which people will be judged. It also, the other overriding theme, or one other one, is, is um, the underscoring of God's oneness. All right, the importance of uh, faith and confidence that there is one God. And I include this not because it's a major theme in the Quran, but just so you know that um, there are verses upon which people build ethical teachings. And one of them is this prohibition on charging interest on loans. So there's an entire world, I'm not sure how it works, but an entire world of Muslim finance that tries to keep Muslim financial institutions in compliance with Quranic teachings about economics. By the way, the Bible also prohibits charging interest on loans. It's just Christians got over it, which is like, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, for the most part. 
All right, so one imp another important difference between um, a Christian approach to sacred text and a Muslim approach is that the Quran is only the Quran in Arabic. And I don't want to overstate this because it's perfectly fine to read translations of the Quran, to, to use translations as tools, to be a perfectly square, you know, you know, valid, full Muslim without knowing Arabic. Um, but if you go to a mosque, it'll generally be read in Arabic. All right, that is essential to an experience of the Quran and to it being uh, the true Quran, which is, is not true of uh, Christian worship. Um, many of the characters and stories that are found in the Quran are also found in the Bible. And I'll say one thing that made a big impression on me when I was an undergraduate is I took a humanities class and we had, we covered Islam in one day and we had a speaker who was Muslim come. And I don't remember a lot of what he said, but he, the thing I do remember is that he passed out a sheet of paper that had quotes on it. And we had to guess whether the quotes were from the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, whether they were from the New Testament, or whether they were from the Quran. All right, so I, I was pretty biblically literate, right? So I was pretty proud of myself of going through all this. Well, the punchline at the end was all of the quotes were from the Quran. So that stuck with me that these traditions have a lot more in common than I knew at the time. There's another category of sacred text known as the hadith, and the hadith are sayings of the prophet and stories about him that are not contained in the Quran. So a faithful Muslim person who wants to find the answer to a question might look to the hadith. Now there are lots of different collections, some considered authoritative by some groups, others not, but I just want you to know there's this whole set of supplemental material. Um, I'm going to mention in a a bit a documentary called Quran by Heart, which I highly recommend. I'll put up an image in a second. But there's a little scene between uh, three teenagers in a bus um, who are using hadith to answer a question of how Muslims should relate to Jews. And one of them said, oh, well, there's this story about the Prophet Muhammad uh, having a Jewish neighbor who didn't like him and would like dump his trash in the Prophet Muhammad's yard and then every day. And then one day he didn't show up. And so the Prophet Muhammad went, because he was sick, and the Prophet Muhammad went to his house and said, um, where were you? I was expecting you to come, you know, yell things at me and put trash in my yard. And, and now I know you weren't here, so I wanted to check and make sure you're okay. Okay. So you get the idea that there are these stories about the Prophet Muhammad. Some are regarded as really credible, some are not, you know, but, but they use them as, and in that case, in that little conversation among the teenagers, they were saying, we should be kind to our Jewish neighbors. All right. So that's just another category of text. So a hafiz or a hafiza is a title for someone who memorizes the entire Quran. Now, I, I, I mean, I'll just tell you, my Penguin edition is about this thick. So if, I don't know if that's a meaningful metric or not, but it's a, it's a good size book, all right? And so there are these contests for um, kind of like American spelling bees for kids usually to memorize the entire Quran in Arabic or as much of it as they can. And many of these kids do not speak any Arabic at all. And so there are you know, schools and programs to teach the memorization of the Quran. So I highly recommend, I want to stress this is like an above and beyond thing. You know, it's like you can be a Christian without being a nun or something, you know, like there's, that's a form of life. You, like, you don't have to, you know, I don't know, go get that intense, right? So um, memorizing the Quran is not an expected or required thing to be Muslim, but it is kind of a, an extra thing. Uh, so the documentary Quran by Heart is fantastic. It follows these kids. I think each of these kids is 10 years old um, from different countries around the world. And it, it's, I find it very stressful as a parent. Like I can barely handle watching my children in a piano recital, you know, like I want them to do well. Well, this is like intense, okay. Um, but it's, so it's a great film for um, really appreciating the diversity of Islam as well, the cultural diversity, racial diversity, linguistic diversity, et cetera. So great, great film. It's a, you can watch it on YouTube. I, I think it's available through HBO, but I've had an, a YouTube link to the full-length film. It's, it's over an hour that has worked for years, so I assume it's still available. All right. I did want to bring in just a couple quotes from the Quran. 
um, that are particularly beautiful, and um, I'm not going to talk a lot about Sufism, but that's kind of a mystical, devotional development of Islam. And it really builds on some of these um, especially beautiful quotes from the Quran. I'll just share two. One describes God as light upon light. Okay, so kind of mystical versions of Islam build on that verse. And this is another one I love. God is described as closer to every single person than is our jugular vein. Okay, so, you know, beautiful image of the intimacy of God with us. All right. So I'm going to share several key terms, again, with a view to kind of outlining some of the central teachings of Islam. The first one is this word Allah, and I want to stress that Allah is not the name of the God that Muslims worship, right? Allah is just the Arabic word for God, all right? So it's not like, well, some Hindus worship Krishna, Christians worship God, and Muslims worship Allah. Okay, it's not a name for a separate God. It just means God. So if you had a translation of the Christian New Testament, let's say, or the Hebrew Bible into Arabic, Allah would be the name of God. All right, so it just means God. Tawid is this really core concept of divine unity. Again, I, there's no way I can, there's some things I can overstress, but this is not one of them. All right, that uh, the unity of God, the um, emphasis in Islam on, the, on pure monotheism. So this is a central teaching. Uh, a prophet is a, this definition is shared with um, Jews and Christians generally. Prophets are human beings through whom God communicates through revelations to the world. It's not someone who predicts the future, right? It's just someone who, can, who reliably communicates the word or the revelations, messages of God. Shirk is often translated as idolatry, but you can think of it as something broader. Uh, some people define it, as I do here, of ascribing partners to God or mistaking anything else for God. Now, I feel like I need to tell you that the, the timing of when I do these um, presentations is completely to do with logistics, right? The church's schedule and my personal schedule and where they align, okay? So I did not sit down and think about doing this presentation on Trinity Sunday, okay? But Trinity Sunday is, you know, is where, you know, Christian... Trinitarian theology really rubs against Muslim monotheism, right? Because um, the doctrine of the Trinity is considered shirk, right? You're ascribing partners to God. Now, that's also a Christian heresy to call the persons of the Trinity partners, but um, the divinity of Christ, right, is shirk. There can be only one God. And another point of contention within Islam is over the devotion that's shown to saints, all right, so some Muslims have a practice of visiting the tombs of saints, particularly holy people, even without calling them divine or God. But to other Muslims, that's like creeping, right? That is shirk because it's creeping toward um, mistaking something else for God. Okay, so, so some Muslims destroy tombs of saints in, in other Muslim countries. Um, Sharia is a term you may have heard. A little bit more literal translation is, is path to water. Um, I think there's a longer version of it too, but it's usually uh, in the West or in the United States, people have heard of Sharia law, right? Um, so I want to say that it's, it is Islamic law, but it's also a process of legal reasoning, okay? So, so just as we saw in Judaism last week, um, the Torah doesn't answer every single question that arises in the life of a faithful Jewish person trying to follow Jewish law. So, for example, can you drive a car on the Sabbath, right? They didn't have cars back then. So you have to have some process for reasoning. So I'll give one example. I haven't talked about Ramadan, but it's a month of fasting. One question is, can you brush your teeth while you're fasting? Okay, so you have to have, and there are different schools of thought. You have some, you know, maybe they might fit into a continuum of conservative to more liberal or something like that. Um, but there are different schools of thought, and some have um, more influence in particular Muslim countries, and others have influence in other Muslim-majority uh, uh, countries. All right, but, but it's a, a similar concept to Judaism, that the law isn't this 
sort of burden, you know, that makes our lives terrible, right? It's, it's a gift that, and a joy, right, that helps human beings to live the, the lives most aligned with the divine as possible. Another word you may have heard is jihad, right, which has the, a basic meaning of struggle, right, or striving. It is found in the Quran. Um, and over time, the notion of jihad has developed. A particular time is during the Crusades, where people reflected on kind of what, what this word for struggle means. So at, in the time of the Crusades and the result of the loss of Jerusalem to Christian crusaders, there's a lot more reflection on what jihad meant. So they distinguish between what's sometimes called the lower jihad. That would be struggle with external enemies and the higher jihad, which is an internal struggle. So today, you hear a lot of Muslims say, um, you know, there's this idea, you know, of jihad as a struggle against internal enemies. But it was kind of a mistake to focus on that type of jihad. The real jihad that we should be focused on is again a struggle against the enemies or forces that draw us from the love of God. Right? I just use some. Christian baptism, Episcopal baptismal language there, but, but it's, you know, we have a, an internal struggle uh, that's the higher or the better jihad, and we're never going to be successful in lower external jihads if we're not successful in the higher one. All right, so the next thing I'm going to walk through just to get a clearer picture of Islam is the five pillars of Islam. And I'll say, so Islam spread very quickly during and immediately following the life of the prophet Muhammad. And a lot of people, there you know, lots of ways to answer the question of why. Lots of theories out there, et cetera. Um, one of those theories, so you might hear this, but I disagree, but one of the theories is, oh, Islam is so easy, right? It's an easy religious tradition. Um, I think it's very, very hard, okay? But, I, but I'll share with some things that make it look or seem a little bit easy. And this is the first one, right, where last time we talked about the Ten Commandments, and there are, like, multiple versions of the Ten Commandments. And if you're making lists of which ten, it can be hard to enumerate them. There's different systems, okay? Well, if... Jews and Christians who adopt these commandments have 10. Muslims only have five pillars, right? Well, let's just cut it in half, right? It's easier to remember, all right? Um, and the first of these, the Shahada or the Creed, I'll show a slide in a second, is way simpler than the Nicene Creed, right? I do not have the Nicene Creed memorized, but the Shahada, the Muslim Creed, is very simple, all right? Um, the second of the five pillars of Islam and these are practices pretty much incumbent upon all Muslims if they're able, okay? Uh, praying five times a day, fasting during the month of Ramadan from sundown to sun up, sorry, from sun up to sundown. <laughs> um, and I think I was thinking of the Sabbath, you guys, doing Judaism and Islam two days in a row, or two Sundays in a row. A little confusing. All right, giving alms to the poor, and lastly, going on the Hajj, that is a pilgrimage to Mecca. So going on the Hajj is an, an example of an expectation for most Muslims if they are physically and financially able. All right, so if you're not physically and financially able, you don't have to go on the pilgrimage, go on the Hajj. Um, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I think there are people who do it more than once, but you're only... Uh, number three, fasting during the month of Ramadan is something you do every year. Um, every lunar year, and going on the Hajj is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. All right, so I'll just go into a little more detail about each of these. The Shahada, um, this is a, the creed, and it's very straightforward. There is no God but Allah, all right, pure monotheism, and Muhammad is his messenger, or Muhammad is the prophet, all right? That's it, okay? And to become a Muslim, all you have to do is, is say this, with the right intention. So there's been a controversy about if you, I think a high school teacher assigned, you know, uh, had a test that was like, what is the Shahada? And there was a controversy because people said, oh, but if I write down what the Shahada, it'll make me Muslim, okay? So it, that's not true. I just read it aloud, right? It doesn't make me Muslim. You have to say it with conviction, right? And the right intention. But this, if you wanted to become a Muslim, this is what you would do. Um, for prayer, five times a day, prayer is spoken in Arabic, 
and it involves lots of physical postures, standing, sitting, kneeling, and prostrating or bowing. I'll show you an image of that in a minute. Uh, and in a mosque, prayer is done in the direction of Mecca, the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad. And it's the direction of Mecca is indicated by a mihrab. All right, so that's a, a niche um, in whatever wall of the mosque faces Mecca. Right? So physical orientation to a sacred place is important. This is an illustration of those postures of prayer. You do this multiple times. And here's someone uh, in a mosque uh, praying. Here as well, all right, so it involves prostration. And the five prayer times kind of vary with the sun, right? It's not like 6 a.m., 9 a.m., you know, whatever. So roughly it would be sunrise. And if you're in a Muslim-majority country, you might hear the call to prayer. I've only... I guess I've been to two Muslim majority countries, Malaysia and Morocco. I don't really remember this from Malaysia, but I do from Morocco, hearing the, the call to prayer indicating it was time to, to pray. Sunrise, noon, afternoon, sunset, and nighttime. Right? So if you've been at an airport, you might see a sign for a Muslim prayer room, right? So you could go pray, if, you know, between your flights, right, if you are in the airport during a specific uh, time when you should be praying, one of these five times a day. All right. So um, Eid just means festival, but I wanted to highlight here, this is an um, important holiday within Islam, and it's for breaking the fast at the end of Ramadan. So uh, Islam follows a lunar calendar, so every month is 28 days. So where Ramadan falls varies. So when it's in the summer, I've heard it's the terrible because you have a long day, right, to fast from sunup to sundown. There's a great video diary. It's pretty edgy. Definitely couldn't show it in church. But um, it's about a, a young man and his reflection on um, observing Ramadan. But he sets his alarm for 3 in the morning and makes a huge breakfast of scrambled eggs and, like, just throws avocado, like, cheese, like all kinds of stuff in there and eats it. Um, to last him through the end of the day. I actually remember a high school friend, um, and, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh, man, I should, wish I'd asked him more about that, but I had a, you know, there was a party in high school, and there was a, a table with snacks, and he was standing next to it, just, you know, like Doritos, things that teenagers eat, right? And, and he was, like, looking at his watch. He's like, okay, now I can eat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he was, like, my one Muslim friend that I knew was Muslim anyway. Um, but just little memories like that. So Eid Mubarak means blessed festival. And um, uh, Eid al-Fatr feature is for, um, is that feast when you might say Eid Mubarak. You could say it in an, uh, it's like saying have a great holiday or something. It applies to multiple holidays. But here it would apply to the um, feast at the end of Ramadan. And there's actually a wonderful stamp that you can buy. I think the first version of the stamp came out under George W. Bush. All right, you know, like you can buy Christmas stamps to send Christmas cards. You can buy... Uh, there's some that say Eid Mubarak as well, Eid greetings. All right, so the Hajj right, is this pilgrimage to Mecca um, during a particular month, not Ramadan, but a different one. And it's not just going to Mecca, right? You, there are several rituals that you need to get through to have completed your Hajj successfully. First of all, you have to enter a state of Iram, which for men means wearing white clothing. Um, women actually have to have their faces uncovered, um, there might be some different traditions within here, but uh, there are things like you, uh, you need to comb your hair, clip your nails, and you can't do those things until you leave your state of, again, until you leave the state of Iram. That's like a kind of ritual purity state. And you do lots of things. You throw rocks at some big walls that symbolize Satan. Um, you run back and forth between two hills. Uh, although in, this is, you actually just, these days, there's so many people who do this. It's a logistical nightmare, you know. Um, I, I have had a student who's uh, Saudi, and he said, oh, you know, they've, they've done a lot of work, right, to make this smooth, right? It's so much crowd control. Um, but anyway, you go through this hallway kind of, or passageway, but it's enormous, right, um, which is supposed to, you know, start it as 
running between these two hills to um, remember Hagar and her search for water for her son, you know, running between these two mountains. Um, uh, anyway, so lots of rituals. And you can see images of, and what's really striking is usually all these people in white. A major part of the uh, observing the um, Hajj is to circle the cube. So if you, uh, the Kaaba, it, this is related to the word, English word for cube from Arabic. Um, and I'll talk about what it is, but if you ever get to see a video of this, it just looks like a sea, I mean, it looks liquid, you know, like swirling around the, the Kaaba. Um, the tradition is that the Kaaba was built either by, Ad this is not from the Quran, but people say, you know, it was built by Adam, the first human, or by angels, and then it was rebuilt again by Abraham, and then later it was purified of its idols by the prophet Muhammad. So here it is. So you have to circumambulate it, that is, go around it a certain number of times. And I've you know, seen people describe, like, if you're with a group, you have to, you know, or your parents or partner or whatever, you have to, like, hold hands <laughs> you know, to, to stay together in this uh, sea of people. All right, so those are the, the pillars of Islam. I'll just talk uh, for a minute about the internal diversity of Islam, especially the split between Sunni and Shia. So lots of people are, uh, have questions or ask about this um, particular divide in Islam. So one thing we need to know is this word caliph, all right, is the title for a successor to Muhammad who leads the Muslim community. And the early period immediately after the Prophet Muhammad, is known as the period of the, the four right-guided caliphs. So there's a crisis of succession, as there usually is when a you know, charismatic leader dies. This is true of Jesus as well, right? There's tension between Peter and Paul you know, and, and some other disciples as well. So the crisis, though, is who should lead after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So the next Caliph, or the first caliph, is Muhammad's father-in-law, who's also his uncle. Um, but at the time, some people wanted Ali to be his successor. So eventually he is, but he wasn't the immediate successor. Then there are a couple others. And finally, we do get Ali, who is Muhammad's cousin, as well as his son-in-law. So Ali is a relative by blood, and Abu Bakr was a relative by marriage. All right, so this is the historical origin of the Sunni and Shia split. So the words, though, come from sunnah, which means kind of customary practice for Muslims. And even today, Sunni are about 80% of Muslims. And Shia comes from the word Shiat Ali, the party of Ali or the partisans of Ali. Um, so here, this is a lot of history, but I just want you to know, again, kind of other forces reinforcing the Sunni and Shia split. So kind of after this period of the four rightly guided caliphs, we have a, a civil war among uh, the Muslim community. And this one particular group kind of secedes from both sides, and they end up assassinating Ali. Uh, this, who, people to today are called the Sunnis follow you know, one particular dynasty of caliphs, the Umayyad dynasty, and the people called Shias today reject them and say that a descendant of Muhammad has to be the caliph. All right, that's a, a critical um, factor in, in the legitimacy of the caliph. So in 680, Muhammad's, uh, so Ali's son, or Muhammad's grandson, Hussein, tried to lead an uprising against the Umayyads and was killed and beheaded. So a major holiday within Shiite Islam is known as Ashura, and that celebrates the martyrdom of Hussein. So uh, I have some images here that I'll show quickly, but they're a little gory, so I just wanted to warn people about that if you don't want to see. I'll show them real quickly, but just sometimes you see this. Um, so Ashura commemorates the martyrdom of Hussein. Some people have ritual scars from celebrating, commemorating this holiday. Um, but you know, if you see in the news around when this happens, you might see some images, mostly from Iraq and Iran. I think that Saddam, the images are gone now, if you didn't want to see them. Um, uh, in, sometimes this holiday gets outlawed, right? If uh, a Sunni you know, group is in power and they don't want this to be a Shiite 
uh, holiday recognized. So the Shia Shahada actually has an additional component. So this is the creed. So it starts the same. There's no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God, and Ali is the friend of God. Okay, so we follow succession through Ali. All right. So this is the whirlwind tour of history. Um, just to emphasize some key kind of developments within Islamic culture. So the Umayyads, right, were followed by the Sunnis. And then we have the Abbasids, right? This is another generation of caliphs. It's the Umayyad dynasty that built the Dome of the Rock, which is in Jerusalem. I mentioned the Western Wall last week. The Dome of the Rock is a mosque built on top of the site of the former temple in Judaism, right? Um, we, the period of the Abbasids is the, the period known as classical Islam when the kind of center, the capital, moves to Baghdad. All right, so we get a shift um, in the center of gravity. And the Abbasids are, most, are responsible for a lot of translations and scientific and mathematical advances. The word for algebra right, comes from this period. Uh, a treatise by a Muslim author, but they translated lots of texts that um, have been important sources of Greek learning, and they translated them into Arabic, and then later people translated them from Arabic into Latin. All right, so we would not have these traditions of Greek learning without the Abbasid translation movement preserving these texts in Arabic. There's some later Islamic empires, the Ottomans in the Mediterranean, the Mughals, and the Safavids. And this, so I emphasize this because this is when the gap between Sunni and Shia gets reinforced. And some people kind of date the importance of that split, even though it has this historical background, to this time when there's competition between different Muslim-majority empires. Um, so the Safavids become Iran, and they are... Um, Famously, Shiite. All right, so here's uh, the Shah Mosque from the, the uh, Safavid Empire. This is from the 1600s, I think. All right. So broadly, again, uh, Sunnis, it, it gets confusing because they both use words, but they use them in the same words in different ways. So an imam in Sunni Islam is someone who leads community prayer on Fridays and in Shia Islam, an imam, I capitalized it here, right, is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad who is an infallible leader of the whole Shia community. The Ayatollah, this may be a familiar term to you, uh, meaning sign of God, is a Shiite religious scholar who has you know, a high level of religious learning. And in Sunni Islam, they believe that Muhammad's successor should be the best person available and in Shia Islam, they believed that Muhammad's successor should be a member of his own family. So you may be wondering, like, well, where's the Shiite imam today? Well, I'll tell you that um, there's different types of Shia Islam, uh, but I'll just talk about Twelver Islam uh, that recognizes something called the occultation, the hiding or the covering of the imam. So Twelver Shiite Muslims traced a line of imams back to Ali, but the 12th imam they th consider in hiding, sort of hidden. We, we don't know where in the universe the 12th imam is. And so this 12th imam, it's like a spiritual concept that channels things like legal rulings, insights, doctrine, through religious scholars, in the case of Iran, and Ayatollah. Okay, so they are channels of the hidden 12th imam. All right, so there are lots of different models in these later periods, you know, lots of different Muslim countries, well, Iran famously, like I said, and also Iraq have very substantial Shiite Muslim populations. Others are, tend to be majority Sunni, and they're all different models for how Islam relates to the governing structure of a particular state. So Turkey, for a long time, was uh, the model was secular nationalism, right? They're not... Um, they accommodate religion. Uh, Pakistan, especially after partition in 1947, often regarded as a Muslim homeland in South Asia. And then Iran, after 1979, is considered an Islamic republic. So there's lots of different ways of um, being a Muslim state. All right. Um, 
a lot of people have questions about veiling, right, in Islam, and so I like to just build up to that by saying there's there's a variety of cultural practices around wearing a veil or not wearing a veil, and um, there's a this is a great documentary between Allah and me and everyone else that profiles a lot of women in Canada from different cultural backgrounds, although they all live in Canada, deciding whether or not to wear um, to wear a veil. Um, but I did want to share this cartoon. All right, this is, um, we have a woman in a bikini looking at a woman um, in a niqab saying, everything is covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture, right? And then you have uh, the woman in the veil say, oh, nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male-dominated culture, <laughs> okay? Um, so I, you know, the between Ali, Allah and me and everyone else does a great job of showing women wrestling with the culture that they live in and um, what they hope that the veil expresses about, about themselves. All right. Okay. So just the, the few reflections that I have on Islam, what I find challenging and illuminating, the first is the beauty of the Quran, as I mentioned, fixed our prayer on the go, and God's overriding mercy. So this is what I'll just do briefly. Um, remember, as I said, the Quran is the Quran only in Arabic. And it makes me wonder, you know, do I need to experience biblical texts in their original languages? Right, does, for it to be really the Bible, you know, what do I need to know about Greek or Hebrew? All right, so that's what I find challenging. Am I missing something when I, I like, I haven't read the whole Bible in the original languages, right? Some passages, but not the whole thing. Um, so I find that challenging, right? And I, usually if I'm preparing a sermon, that's when I do it. And there are real gaps, you know, between what we read in church and the possibilities and the trend. You know, sometimes... I get mad, right? I'm like, why did they translate it this way? Okay, you know, but like, really, like, do we have to learn Hebrew and Greek fully to understand everything? You know, I, I don't know. I, I find that challenging. But what I find illuminating is I, I once went to, you know, just a, a panel and someone talked about um, what she, one thing that Christians and Jews, well, I won't speak for Jews, it's Christians, um, sometimes what we miss is the beauty of our scriptures, right? And she said for her experiencing, so these are often chanted, the Quran is, musically. Um, and she said, I, like, its meaning is important, but its beauty is also important. And so that's what I took away from her is, is to say, maybe reading the whole thing in the original language is important, but it's not just important because it clarifies the meaning or something, or opens up new meanings. It's important because the original language is part of the beauty of it. And so I took away that I need to value both the beauty of scripture and the meaning. Right. Uh, another thing that I find illuminating and challenging is this practice of prayer five times a day. And in Episcopal Christianity, we have a, a similar thing, right? Um, if you, there's, they're optional, but um, some of the hours, but often people pray morning prayer, sometimes noonday prayer, sometimes evening prayer, and sometimes compline, that is prayer before bed. So these are services all outlined in the Book of Common Prayer. Um, there are tools for this. There's, um, you know, of course, a Book of Common Prayer. There's also something called a Traveler's Prayer Book that you can take with you that has kind of boiled down versions of all of those um, offices, all those prayer offices. Well, let me, uh, I want to play a little video for you of a song. So um, if you're familiar at all with kind of Christian devotional pop music, it usually emphasizes how awesome God is, right, and how much Jesus loves us. Okay, that's like it, you know. Um, but Muslim pop devotional music actually celebrates the practice of fixed hour prayer. I absolutely love it. So I found this song called The Crazy Spots I've Prayed, and it's a, uh, by a man talking about praying at different places, you know, stopping to do fixed hour prayer uh, in all these different places. So the chorus is, all the earth is a place of prostration, every field and meadow, mountain, park, city, farm, plantation, etc. Um, and I'll play it, but he talks about praying in a, sop in a, shopping, in a uh, shopping mall, 
Uh, he goes to a dressing room to pray there, you know. Um, and then he has this wonderful se sequence. You know, there was a time next to the river. There was a time in the school hall, you know, all this all these places he's prayed. So to listen to it, I want to share a couple terms. One is the call to prayer, right? In Muslim countries, it's usually broadcast from a minaret, right, to summon Muslims to prayer at each of those times. He talks about sunrise prayer and wudu, this ritual washing that's typically done before prayer. All right, so those will help understand. I'm just going to play this song. It's a couple minutes long. All the earth is a place of prostration. Every field and meadow, mountain, park, city, farm, plantation. Every roadside, seaside, hillside, walkway, any place clean and green can be a place to pray. When I think of every path where I have ever trod, I laugh at all the crazy spots I stop to worship God. Remember that long car ride, driving all night so far. Under the summer moon, we pulled off to the side, reclining in the front seat of the car, waking to a fadger bird sound, and washing in the coin car wash we found with the water blaster making wound do. You sprayed me. And I sprayed you We stood so drowsy in the dawn Behind the car wash dripping on the lawn All the earth is a place of prostration Every field and meadow, mountain, park, city, farm, plantation Every roadside, seaside, hillside, walkway, any place clean and green can be a place to pray. When I think of every path where I have ever trod, I laugh at all the crazy spots I stop to worship God. Saturday shopping day, in a busy mall, I'm busting through the aisles, worldly wants getting in my way. Each blank zombie shop, a face for the smiles, time comes for a prayer attack. Grab a pair of pants or a sweater from a rack, find a change room and latch the door. Set aside excuses. And hit the floor as I go back to the mall It's easier then to make sense of it all All the earth is a place of prostration Every field and meadow, mountain, park, city, farm, plantation Every roadside, seaside, hillside, walkway Any place clean and green can be a place to pray When I think of every path where I have ever trod I laugh at all the crazy spots I stop to worship God So I'll say that as an Episcopalian Christian um, I connect more with that song, right, than I do with lots of Christian devotional sad pop most music. Of the time, losing interest in things oh, you once sorry. cared about, you may be experiencing these and other uh, symptoms that are difficult to understand. These symptoms. Are it's always fun. This happens with my students. Like you know, ads pop up. I'm like, oh my gosh, what do they think about me based on what the algorithms think I want to buy? It's really embarrassing. So. Um, Anyway, but I connect with that song because I'm someone who has prayed morning prayer, evening prayer, in a subway, you know, on the go. And so I really connect with that um, uh, piece. And, yeah. All right, so I'm going to actually start here with the when I find illuminating from that is that fixed hour prayer on the go, like in your life, where you are. You know, it's morning, you pray there, in your car, wherever it is. That song helps me to be reminded that praying, even if it's not in a church, like it's a reminder that all the world is a place of worship, right? Not just uh, church. The challenge, though, that I find, I really like that song because it's so embodied, right? For for um, this type of, you know, an, an observant Muslim, fixed hour prayer is the pa a practice of the body, not just the mind and the heart, right? So if you're in a country, you, they'll see people unroll their prayer mats, like right here, you know, and drop and do their prayers and stuff. Um, it's not something for me that tends to involve my body quite so much. So I ask, like, you know, it, he talk, they even do the ritual washing, right, in the car wash, right? Uh, so I ask, how can I involve my body in this prayer, prostration, washing, attention to physical sensations? That's sort of like what I find challenging, kind of how can I uh, make the most of this practice of fixed hour prayer, which we share with lots of other traditions. Um, I'm not going to use slides to talk about this last part because it's already 1050. But um, uh, there's just this statement about the overriding mercy of God. 
Um, and just my one example is during COVID, right? There, all kinds of church, all kinds of religious institutions were saying, "What should we do? You know, should we have worship? Should we not? Or whatever?" Um, and there's a kind of body in North America that reasons with these questions. And the question was, should so for Sunni men, you need to pray on Friday afternoons in the mosque, right? It needs to be in the mosque. Um, and so the reason they came out with was it, what I like about. Uh, for me, I often am tempted into this reasoning process of, well, I need to use the Bible and tradition and experience to show that my view is right, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you really understood what Jesus said, it would be what I think, you know? I'm often tempted. So they, they actually went the opposite way. They said, yes, you know, like, the, if, you know, if you, if you reason it out, right, you need to be in the mosque, COVID or no COVID. But then they said, but... God is merciful, right? And so what they did, kind of the reasoning, and then they said, here's all these examples, passages of the Quran, and the kind of final opinion was, they had a majority and a minority opinion, actually, but the majority, like the Supreme Court, so the majority is, like, it is incumbent on you. It will be a matter to be addressed on the day of judgment, but guess what? Allah is merciful, Right, And so I just love that, that instead of using reasoning to support their point, which was don't come to the mosque at the height of COVID, you know, they used reasoning to come to one conclusion and then forced people to rely on the mercy of God. And, and so that was really powerful to me to see, you know, that just this very consistent reliance on the overriding mercy of God. All right. I didn't have to. I don't have to preside or anything, so I could go a little bit late here. I don't have to throw on my vestments. So um, I'm looking forward to Trinity Sunday worship, and but I'll hang out for a couple minutes if you want to chat or have questions. Thanks. <laughs>